Have you ever heard the term junctional rhythms and wondered what the heck that is? Well, it's not a common rhythm that you see, but it's really important that you know it when you do encounter it. In this video, we're going to be talking about the ECG study guide rhythm of junctional rhythms. Let's get started. So we always begin by talking about our junctional rules. It's important to note that the impulse that initiates the heartbeat is going to start in the AV node itself and it only travels downwards towards our ventricles. Because the rhythm is originating at or above the junction, we're still gonna see a normal and narrow QRS complex. But what's interesting here is that the intrinsic rate is gonna be a little bit different. Remember we talked about the SA node and the AV node, they both have their own set of intrinsic rates. So the AV node has an intrinsic rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. This is gonna be really big when we're talking about these junctional rhythms. What's really important to note is that that P wave must meet one of four criteria in order for it to be deemed a true junctional rhythm. And we use the mnemonic errors to help us remember that. The A stands for absent, the I stands for inverted, the R stands for retrograde, and the S stands for short. Starting with our A for absent P waves, this occurs because the impulse doesn't travel back up towards the atria. So no P wave is gonna be formed in the ECG before the QRS complex, as the atria are not activated before our ventricles. And then next up we have inverted P waves. So in some cases, an electrical impulse can get through and it's gonna travel back up into our atria. We call this retrograde conduction. This backwards movement causes that P wave to appear inverted on our ECG because the electrical vectors are moving from the bottom of the atria upwards rather than the top of our atria down. And then next up we have our retrograde P wave. And this is when the P wave is visible following our QRS complex. This indicates that the atrias are contracting after the ventricles do due to the impulse traveling backwards later. And then lastly, we have short PR intervals. This happens because the impulse originates near or within that atrial ventricular node and has a very short distance that it has to travel in order to reach the ventricles compared to an impulse that originates from our SA node. So that's when you're gonna see basically this hugging of our P wave to the QRS. Just to review, the junction of rhythm is a type of cardiac arrhythmia where the heart's primary pacing responsibility shifts from that sinoatrial node to the atrial ventricular node or the surrounding tissue. This ultimately occurs when that sinoatrial node fails to initiate the heartbeat or the impulse is blocked somewhere along the pathway, prompting that atrial ventricular node to take over. This backup system helps maintain a heartbeat, but at a different rate and rhythm than our normal sinus rhythms. So what are we gonna see with junctional rhythms? Well, to begin with, we're going to see a rhythm that is regular. Next, we're going to have a rate that's a little bit slower because of where it originates from. Remember, we talked about before, the sinoatrial node usually typically has a heartbeat between 60 to 100 beats per minute, while our atrial ventricular node has a heartbeat between 40 and 60 beats per minute. P waves are either going to be absent, inverted, retrograde, or short in order for them to qualify as a junctional rhythm. The PR interval, if it is present, the P wave may have a short PR interval, meaning that it's going to be less than 0.12 seconds, or the interval is just not going to exist. And as we said before, anytime we have a rhythm that originates from the junction, we are going to see a normal and narrow QRS complex. Remember, if we see a big, wide, and ugly QRS complex, then we're most likely looking at something else. So let's talk about the causes as to why this occurs. One of the things could be is that there's an SA node dysfunction, and that's the failure of the SA node to generate an impulse or there's some kind of blockage taking place that's not allowing that impulse to exit the SA node. We can also see enhanced AV automaticity, meaning that that AV node increases its intrinsic pacemaker activity. As always, there could be medications that are causing this. You could see things like digitalis, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers that are ultimately going to suppress that SA node activity from taking place, or it's going to enhance the AB nodal activity. Having previously worked as a CVICU nurse, this is very common with our cardiac surgery patients. A lot of times when we have post-operative complications, it's going to interfere with the normal electrical conduction systems of our heart. And then lastly, we could see it with myocardial infarction due to the damage that's taking place to the heart tissues, ultimately affecting the conduction system. 
As always, you're gonna see a lot of the same signs and symptoms. You're gonna see palpitations due to the abnormal heart rhythm. The patient could be fatigued from reduced cardiac output if their rate is particularly slower. We could see dizziness and lightheadedness related to that decreased blood flow to the brain, shortness of breath, especially when the patient is exerting themselves. And then lastly, syncope. Fading spells could occur with severe cases and significant bradycardias. So how are we gonna treat this particular rate? Rhythm. Well, treatment for junctional rhythms are always going to focus on addressing the underlying condition that's causing it. We also want to make sure that we're monitoring these patients. Asymptomatic patients or those with benign causes might only require minimal observation when it comes to this particular rhythm. We may even want to adjust medications. We're going to review and adjust medications based on what's contributing to the arrhythmia. In more severe symptomatic bradycardia cases, you're going to see pacemakers that may be needed in order to help maintain that adequate heart rate. And then lastly, you may even see electrophysiology studies taking place. It's really to evaluate the heart's electrical system for a more targeted treatment in those more complex cases. Next up, we have accelerated junctional rhythms, and they follow the same rules as junctional rhythms. However, they have a little bit of a faster heart rate. Anytime our heart rate is greater than the intrinsic rate, but less than 100, we call these rhythms accelerated. As we know, the intrinsic rate for the atrial ventricular node is between 40 to 60 beats per minute. So anytime the rhythm is between 61 to 100 beats per minute and also meets that junctional criteria that we talked about before, we call that rhythm accelerated. So what's going on here? The rhythm is going to be regular. Our heart rate's gonna be a little bit faster, 61 to 100 beats per minute. The P wave is gonna remain the same. It has to meet that AIRS criteria. The PR interval is gonna be variable depending on if it's there or not. It's gonna be less than 0.12 seconds if it is. The QRS complex is going to be narrow and normal and we're not gonna see any abnormal beats. Ultimately, the causes, signs and symptoms, and treatments are going to remain the same. And next up, we are going to have junctional tachycardia. Remember, they're going to follow the same criteria. However, the heart rate is going to increase between 101 beats per minute all the way up to 150 beats per minute. Remember, anytime we have a heart rate that's greater than 150 beats per minute with this narrow or normal complex of our QRS, we're going to be looking at a supraventricular tachycardia. So again, let's look at our breakdown here. The rhythm is going to remain regular. Our heart rate's gonna be a little bit faster between 101 and 150 beats per minute. It should still meet that AIRS criteria. The PR interval will be variable depending on if it's there, and if it is, it should be less than 0.12 seconds. Our QRS complex is going to remain narrow and normal, and we shouldn't have any abnormal beats. And as always, the causes, the signs and symptoms, as well as the treatment are all going to remain the same except for one thing. You may see a cardioversion or an ablation that's gonna take place here. If the heart rate has become a little bit too high for our liking, we may end up doing a cardioversion or ablation ultimately to slow down that heart rate. So let's do some practice. Here is our first practice example. So as always, do we have a regular or an irregular heart rate? If I was to measure from each R to R complex, they look exactly the same. So I would say that we have a regular heart rhythm. Next up, we're gonna look at our heart rate. So again, for dexterity purposes, we're just going to count the QRS complexes, but just know you should count all of the small boxes in between each R to R complex and divide them by 1500. Here we have one, two, three, four, five QRS complexes. So we have approximately 50 beats per minute. Next up, do we have any P waves? Well, as you can see here, we have this flat line before each QRS complex, and we don't have any extra lines that would make it seem like we have some P wave someplace else. So in this case, I'm going to say that our P wave is absent. Because we don't have any P waves, we don't have a PR interval, so we know that that is automatically eliminated. And if we take a look at our QRS complexes, they do appear to be narrow and normal. So I would say just based on looking at it, it's probably about 0.08 seconds. And do we have any abnormal beats? Absolutely not, so we can automatically eliminate that as well. So based on the criteria of everything that we see here, especially the fact that we have a slower heart rate and an absent P wave, we know that this rhythm is a junctional rhythm. 
Let's take a look at our next practice example. So again, we start with rhythm. Do we have a regular rhythm or do we have an irregular rhythm? Based on what I can see here, it looks like everything is falling in the exact same place whenever we measure. So we would call this rhythm regular. Next up, we wanna go ahead and count our QRS complexes. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I have approximately 90 beats per minute. Then I wanna take a look at my P waves. Do I have any P waves? Well, let me see here. Right here, it looks like I actually have maybe a little bit of an inversion here that's taking place. Then I have no P wave. Oh, look at that. I got a little bit of an inversion there too. So the P waves are kind of variable, right? So we have both absent and we're gonna have inverted P waves. So because I have inverted P waves, I do have a little bit of a variation when it comes to my PR interval, but ultimately it's going to be less than 0.12 seconds. Next up, take a look at our QRS complex. It does appear to be narrow and normal all the way down our six second strip. Again, I'm gonna say this is approximately 0.08 seconds based on what I'm seeing. And then lastly, do I have any abnormal beats? Absolutely not, we don't have any of that. So taking a look at our criteria, knowing we have a regular rhythm, it's 90 beats per minute, but I do have this variation in my P waves. I know I'm looking at a junctional rhythm, but I'm not looking at a normal junctional rhythm. I'm looking at something else specifically because of of this heart rate. This heart rate is greater than the intrinsic rate, but it's less than 100. So based on what I can see here, I have an accelerated junctional rhythm. Again, the biggest key I want you to take away from this video is that if the rate is greater than the intrinsic rate, but less than 100, we call it an accelerated rhythm. And now we're gonna take a closer look at our last example. So again, we start with rhythm. Do I have a regular or irregular rhythm? Well, if I was to march out between each R to R wave, I can see here that I have a regular rhythm. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in here. Next up, we wanna determine our heart rate. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So I have approximately 120 beats per minute. Next up, I wanna take a look at my P waves. So as you can see here, I really don't have any P waves that I'm able to note here. So I'm gonna say that our P waves are absent. Because I don't have any P waves, there's no PR interval that's gonna be measured, so I can automatically eliminate that. And then looking at our QRS complexes, they do appear to all be narrow and normal, which means they're happening at or above the junctions. These actually to appear to be a little bit more narrow than the examples we saw before. So I'm gonna say that this one's about 0.04 seconds. And then lastly, do we have any no abnormal beats? Not that I can see here, so we can eliminate that. So now we're gonna take a look at our criteria. I have a regular rhythm, it's 120 beats per minute, so I know I'm dealing with some kind of tachycardia, but the thing that makes this a junctional rhythm is the fact that I have absent P waves. There's no P waves to be seen here and I have a regular rhythm. So taking a look, look at this example, I know that I have a junctional tachycardia. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding the differences between your junctional rhythms. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources in order to help you ace those ECG concepts. And as always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!